Hello, I'm Amanda Burrell and welcome to Planet SOS. The most comprehensive study into life on Earth says the natural world is in decline. Ecosystems are collapsing. More plants and animals face extinction than at any other time in history. I'm Lucia Newman in the Amazonian state of Pará, where until not so long ago, every centimetre you see behind me was covered by rainforest. Now it's being cleared by fire and by saw in the name of progress. We'll look at what we're doing to the planet and what we can do about it. New ideas and new technology to help revive some of the world's most endangered species. Momentum is growing around the world to keep our warming planet cool. From the top levels of government to grassroots initiatives on the front lines, people are stepping up to address a global climate crisis. But we face an ecological crisis too. From the destruction of natural habitats to pollution, overfishing to climate change, Earth's rich biodiversity is in decline. And this is why we're devoting this episode of Planet SOS to efforts to revive the natural world. In May, the UN published the most comprehensive study of life on Earth. 450 experts analysed thousands of documents over three years. They found one million species face extinction. That's more than 12% of known life on Earth. We're on track to destroy the natural infrastructure on which our world depends, unless there's radical change. The report identifies the five main drivers of this ecological crisis in order of importance. And humanity looms over them all. First, the way we use and abuse our planet's resources. 75% of the land and two thirds of the marine environment have been severely altered by human activity. Then, exploitation of species through overfishing and hunting, climate change caused by our greenhouse gas emissions, pollution of the water, air and land, and finally, the havoc wreaked on local ecosystems by invasive species. The report's authors say the decline can be slowed, even stopped in some cases, but to do that, we must transform our relationship with Earth and life upon it. This report says we have a serious problem. If we continue to produce our food and our energy in the same way as we do today, we will lose biodiversity and change the Earth's climate. But our report also say there are solutions. We can produce food more sustainably. We can choose to use our energy more sustainably. So there is hope, but we need political action from governments and the private sector and the public today. One solution is to create legally protected areas. But when the land and sea hold valuable resources, we can be torn between protection and prosperity. In June, Niger's government announced plans to open up access to its oil reserves within a protected national park. Al Jazeera traveled to the Termit and Tintuma Reserve to see what's at stake. The drive from the nearest city in Niger to Africa's largest nature reserve takes two days in 40 degree heat. The Termit Massif and Tin Tuma Reserve covers 100,000 square kilometers, the size of South Korea, and was once home to unique wildlife, much of which has disappeared. Even two years ago, there were thousands of animals in the bush. But now, there are very few. We've been here now for 24 hours. We haven't seen anything. Everything is destroyed. In 2012, after years of pressure by scientists, Niger's government granted the reserve protection from development and hunting. But environmental groups say that hasn't stopped poachers. The only tracks Al Jazeera saw during a recent visit were from two protected species, a single Nubian bustard bird and a camera-shy Dama gazelle as well as the motorcycles of suspected poachers. There was no sign of the reserve's most critically endangered animal, the Adex antelope. 200 roamed this area a decade ago, but six years later, only three were found. Scientists believe 90% or more have been killed by poachers. Another treasure lies below the sand. Oil exploration threatens the reserve itself. In June, the government said it would redraw the park's borders to allow more oil development after striking a deal with one of the world's largest energy companies, China's National Petroleum Corporation. 
Three months later, Niger's president, Mohamedou Isufu, inaugurated the construction of an oil pipeline running through it. The function, the objectives of the reserve hasn't changed. The geographic position hasn't changed. This is just a redefinition of the limits to optimize the usage of our natural resources because we want to use them for the benefit of the population. Animal conservation groups have called on the government to reverse its decision to remap the reserve in a bid to save the addicts. Technology is improving all the time. Um, we have ways and means of breeding species. Well, it's too late when they've all gone, but so long as there's one or two still alive, it's not too late. The new map of the reserve has yet to be released. But in the nearest city, the trucks line up full with oil, connecting the distant animal reserve to a world thirsty for its energy riches. Colin Baker, Al Jazeera. Another unique environment that's under pressure is the Amazon. It's the world's largest rainforest and one of the most biologically diverse places on Earth. Two-thirds the size of the U.S., it spans eight countries and is home to one in every ten known species. It's often described as the lungs of the planet, but that function, along with its exceptional biodiversity, is under threat. And nowhere is that more clearly seen than in Brazil. There have been over 60,000 wildfires in the Amazon this year alone. Many are reported to have been started deliberately to clear land for agriculture. And then there's the problem of illegal logging. Our Latin America editor, Lucia Newman, traveled to Anapu in northern Brazil, where people are risking their lives to save the forest. The Amazonian state of Pará is in the heart of the Brazilian rainforest. It's three times the size of California. And like 19th century California, it's witnessing a gold rush of sorts. Except instead of gold, this is the attraction. This tree was more than 500 years old, one of the latest victims of a lumber mafia that operates here. The illegal activities that impact the environment, such as mining and logging, are done in the most remote areas, in regions with little infrastructure, no police, and where the power structure is linked to the criminals. But there are people who are resisting and who are setting an example by showing it's possible to live from the forest without destroying it. El Benicio dos Santos and his family have been living here for more than 10 years, on 20 hectares of forest land. They share another far larger area with other members of the PDS, or Sustainable Development Project Virola Jatoba. The project is a new model for a settlement in Amazonia to see if it can inhibit and diminish deforestation. Before, 80% of the land was allowed to be cleared and 20% preserved. Later, it changed to 50-50. Now you must preserve 80% and can deforest only 20%. The community is allowed to obtain oil from a limited amount of select trees and sell the wood. Enough to live on, but at the same time, leave the forest standing. Wild macaws and parrots have become the family's voluntary pets. It's a life that Cristiani loves. You produce what you consume. It's a calm life. It's easy to educate your children because you don't have so much negative influence from the media and internet. But El Vinicio and other community leaders are being targeted by illegal loggers who covet their land and see their project as a threat. One of its founders, an American nun, was murdered in broad daylight. And the community center was recently burnt down. These trees were abandoned here by illegal loggers when Environmental Institute officers just happened to come by here by chance. In fact, in the last three months alone, more than 1,000 trees have been cut down here by the illegal loggers, and there is nothing that people in the community here can do about it. Threats and invasions by land grabbers are intensifying. Of course we feel afraid. People are afraid to leave their family. They managed to kill Sister Dorothy. They thought if they killed her, the rest would flee. But thank God it hasn't happened, and I don't think it will. The government offers them no protection. But El Benicio and the others insist they will stay put to defend this forest enclave in Brazil's most ravaged region. Lucia Newman, Anapu, Brazil, for Planet SOS. 
Now, there are some success stories. In Costa Rica, deforestation is kept at bay through government programs and ecotourism initiatives. Bhutan's constitution requires at least 60% of the land there to be covered in forest. And Gabon has just become the first African country to be rewarded with international funds, $150 million for preserving its forests. In Brazil, some have accused the country's leader, Jair Bolsonaro, not just of failing to act, but of denying the science too, in order to fulfill his development agenda. He took power in January, but in June, when Brazil's space research agency said deforestation had gone up more than 80% on the previous year, he sacked the agency's head and called the statistic a lie. And he's remained defiant. Even after afternoon skies darkened over the city of Sao Paulo in August due to smoke from fires burning thousands of kilometers away. It is a fallacy to say that the Amazon is a heritage of mankind and a misconception confirmed by scientists that our Amazonian forests are the lungs of the world. It needs to be highlighted that there are burnings done by Indians and local populations as part of their respective cultures and means of livelihood. Often, some of these leaders, such as tribal chief Raoni, have been used as maneuvering tools, manipulated by governments or foreign governments in the information war to promote their interests in the Amazon. Well, the tribal leader Bolsonaro was referring to in that speech said this in response. Bolsonaro said that I am not a leader. It is he who is not a leader, and he has to leave. Before something serious happens, Bolsonaro must leave for the good of everyone. Well, to speak more about the fight to defend the Amazonian rainforest, I'm joined by Kurikindi from the Nina Amarin community in the Ecuadorian Amazon. He speaks to us from London, where he's now living. Kurikindi, I understand you are unable to return home because of your campaigning against the oil companies who are trying to encroach on your tribe's territory. I was against it strongly in, in Ecuador. We say indigenous people, we are not agree with the oil company. So when I was in the UK, I, 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 after one month, month, I had to go to Ecuador and I received a message saying I can't go there because uh, the government put someone waiting for me to, in the airport to take me and send the prison. That was how I'm starting in the UK. And what were you campaigning against? What are the old companies wanting to do in your territory? So indigenous people, we said uh, the rainforest is our home, our garden and our pharmacy. People want to go to the rainforest to drill for the oil, so it's affecting the, everything alive in the rainforest. When the oil company people arrive there, they arrive with alcohol, technology, and this exploiting and I think manipulating indigenous people. They are cutting the harmony, how we live there. They are contaminating the, the water, the land, with that toxic things, they are killing uh, insects, animals. Sometimes people say there's nothing happened, but I have my experience and I know what is happening in the rainforest. With your shamanic view of the world, what do you, how do you see climate change? What is going on from Mother Nature's point of view? I'm a man who, who walk with the dreams, uh, who walk with the vision, who walk with the message. So when I was very young, I, I knew what is happening in the planet. We have the, the fire in, in Brazil, and people ask me, oh, what do you think about that? And I said, it's, all we, it's only a starting. It's many, many, many fires going to happen in the planet. So it's very important to say, we love the, 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 the Earth, and it's still leaders, government, have to go with their heart, have to understand what is to love. You know, if we, if we love, my daughter, if we love my country, if we love my rainforest, I'm going to love everything in the, in the planet in the same way. I'm not going to divide my love. Is there a message that you want to convey to us and to viewers of the program? If you could say it in your language. Quintasha Rimasha Purinchi, Nyukanchi Ursawa, Nyukanchi Uyaiwa, Himarai Kutashu Gruna Guna, Nyukanchi Rimashkata Mana Uyanu. Well, 
It's not just the Amazon that's burning. As our planet warms, forests around the world are being lost to fires. You can get more information on where they are on NASA's Earth Observation Site. The maps show the locations of active fires detected by satellites on a monthly basis. And those fires are releasing ever more carbon and other greenhouse gases like methane. Here's how our data tracker looks this week. You've got the global temperature rise there, levels of CO2 in the atmosphere and sea level rise. So some of the big numbers to help us understand what's going on with our planet. Now we promised solutions on Planet SOS and people are already doing a lot to try to turn nature's decline around. And we'll have some of their stories in upcoming episodes, including the scientists and activists out on the open seas who are working to understand our oceans and protect life within them. We'll be in Guatemala, where indigenous practices are enabling communities to build an economic base and preserve the rainforests. And we'll meet the people trying to steer us away from meat produced on an industrial scale and towards food items they insist are a hit with burger lovers. But now to Central Africa, where mountain gorillas are among the most threatened creatures on Earth. Al Jazeera's Stephanie Decker travelled to the Virunga Mountains in Rwanda, where carefully controlled tourism is slowly reversing the fortunes of these great apes. What you do then, try to step back. We're at the foot of the Virunga Mountains and getting a briefing on how to behave around the mountain gorilla. That's what everyone here has come to see, and they've paid $1,500 each to spend one hour with the great apes in their habitat. Are you excited? I am beyond excited. This is an international treasure that is being protected in Rwanda, and I'm so lucky to be able to experience it. I can't wait. We trekked uphill for over an hour, and then... Right in front of us, a family, babies, mothers, and the impressive great big family man, the silverback. The young ones are curious. We have to move back, not to get too close. Others seem almost bored by our presence. Then, a display of power. We walk around to get another view. It's incredible how close we are to these mountain gorillas and they're very relaxed, just really watching us, watching them. Now these great apes were facing extinction just a couple of decades ago and there is some rare good news now. Their numbers are on the increase. Before we know it, the hour is up and it's time to trek back down. We're literally surrounded, we've been surrounded by three silverbacks, all the females. My heart's going like this, it's amazing. Rwanda's tourism policy, we're told, is one of low volume, high value. Visitor numbers are restricted and the price is high. It translates to $25 per minute for the hour spent with the gorillas. Tourists actually who come to see the gorillas understand um, why we've done that. Um, our strategy has actually proven to be the right way to do this. Uh, we've seen a 26% increase in the number of individual gorillas, um, so it's working. It's a fragile success story, critically endangered for years. Now their status has been adjusted to endangered. The latest census shows there are just over a thousand gorillas, up from just around 200 a few decades ago. But that still doesn't seem a large number when you think that it's the whole world's entire population of these incredible animals. Stephanie Decker, Al Jazeera, in the Virunga Mountains of Rwanda. Well, to another more high-tech solution now, a robot that could help save the critically endangered northern white rhino. Rob Reynolds is in San Diego, where scientists are working on a new technology that's already given them cause for celebration. Meet Edward, the littlest southern white rhino in the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. He is adorable. He is fantastic. We are just so lucky to be able to have him. Adorable little Eddie is the first southern white rhino born through artificial insemination in North America. That's an important step toward bringing back another rhino subspecies from the brink of extinction. 
The animals have been hunted to obliteration in the wild, and today there are only two northern white rhinos left in the entire world, both elderly females living in captivity. So the subspecies seems doomed, or maybe not. Part of biologist Barbara Durant's job involves giving ultrasound exams to pregnant rhinos. And you can see the movement of the fetus. Durant is leading an effort to bring back the northern white rhino with a precious clutch of the animal's stem cells and an audacious plan. A stem cell is a cell that has the potential to be any other cell in the body. Eventually, they will, we want to differentiate them all the way to sperm and eggs. But there's a big catch. Female rhino anatomy, it turns out, is complicated. The cervix, which you have to go through to deposit the semen, is very convoluted. It looks like a series of rings like this. So we're going to have to have something that is very flexible that can go around all those curves. And that's where engineering professor Mike Yip comes in. He wasn't thinking about impregnating rhinos when he developed this flexible robotic catheter for microsurgery. But it turns out it's perfect for the job. We've developed the robotic tool that is a very thin, long, flexible device that we can very accurately steer um, through these narrow channels. The ultimate goal of this project is to produce a self-sustaining herd of northern white rhinos, first in captivity and then return to the wild in Africa. That goal is decades away, and Durant says she may not live to see it happen, but that's okay. What we're doing now is extremely important for the long game, for the long haul. Dedicated scientists and a bold plan to save one of the world's rarest creatures. Rob Reynolds, Al Jazeera, Escondido, California. I'm joined now by Mariana Hond, our science and technology editor. Mariana, the northern white rhino was doomed to extinction only five or so years ago. This is an incredible advance in the technology. Yes, and the speed of these advances gives us hope. But the end game is about survival in the wild, and this is still going to be challenging. Scientists in conservation biology will talk about a minimum viable population. Now, this is the estimate of the smallest number of individuals of a species for there to be a healthy and viable population in the wild. Now, one species may bounce back from a single breeding pair, but another may require hundreds of individuals for it to survive. There are a number of factors at play, like the habitat, whether it still exists, how easily they can reproduce, and we know that that's difficult for the northern white rhino, and whether those threats still exist, whether there's poaching, other environmental hazards. So a long road ahead, uh, but these are promising and very exciting developments in the science and the technology. And there are one million species that are facing extinction, an absolutely massive number. What can we do to turn around the, the wider decline of so many species facing extinction? Well, it can start in our own backyard. Avoiding the use of herbicides and pesticides which pollute and stay in the soil. Developing local ecosystems around us, regenerating local landscapes. Making planet-friendly choices, such as avoiding products that might have been cultivated on deforested land. Cutting down what we consume, getting serious about pollution, saying no to plastic. For many of us, this requires a real shift in our thinking from years of old behavior and making the planet and prioritizing life upon it. For me, the shift came when I took personal responsibility for what I was doing, not anyone else, and recognizing that combined millions of us, billions of us even, can make a change. It's not easy, it's challenging. Uh, we won't always get it right, but lecturing people about what they should or shouldn't do, that's not helpful. And what is helpful, what's useful, uh, is leading by example. Thank you, Mariana. Well, there are some striking images online which illustrate the extent of the biodiversity and climate crisis. Like some of the winning entries from the CIWEM Environmental Photographer of the Year, this picture, which is of homes being engulfed by flooding in Mumbai, took the top prize. And we'd really like to hear your stories too, and to see any photos you'd like to share. How is your world changing? We'd love to hear what you're doing to look after our planet. And you can get in touch with us on Twitter using the hashtag AJPlanetSOS. 
Next week, we'll bring you a Planet SOS special from Iceland, where the largest international summit on the Arctic is about to get underway. As the ice melts and the waterways open up, we'll explore the tension between development and protection of our planet's coldest reaches. Well, that's it for Planet SOS this week. From me, Amanda Burrell, and the whole team, goodbye for now.